I'm enrolling in Medicare soon, and it had me a little confused. Then I found MyHealthPolicy.com. With MyHealthPolicy.com, I could go online and compare Medicare Advantage plans from some top-rated national insurers, including $0 monthly premium plans. I could learn about plans in my area and talk with a licensed insurance agent if needed. MyHealthPolicy.com has made doing my research a whole lot easier. My choice, my Medicare, MyHealthPolicy.com. New to Medicare? Start now. Go to MyHealthPolicy.com to learn about some of the top-rated Medicare Advantage plans in your area, including plans for $0 a month in plan premiums, low out-of-pocket costs, and expansive provider networks. If you're thinking about a Medicare Advantage plan, MyHealthPolicy.com is a great place to go to find a plan that meets your needs. Learn more about your options. Even talk with a licensed insurance agent. MyHealthPolicy.com. Hey everyone, before we get into tonight's episode, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to tell you about my upcoming event. I'm so excited. This year will be four years that I've been doing the Oh Hell No podcast and finally I have put together my first event. This is going to be a yearly event and it's called the Oh Hell Yes series. So this year we are focusing on self-awareness. So this year's event is called Oh Hell Yes to Self-Awareness Summit. It's a three-day summit. It's virtual and there are three key themes. We are doing the self-awareness happy hour on Friday, October 9th, financially sound Saturdays on October 10th and self-care Sunday on October 11th. All of these days are centered around self-awareness. So the happy hour, we'll be talking about the importance of self-awareness. On the Financially Sound Saturday, we'll be talking about finances and self-awareness and reinvention. And on Sunday for self-care, we'll be talking about self-awareness and mental health and self-awareness in mind and body. I'm really excited because we have seven amazing speakers who have all been a part of the Oh Hell No podcast. If you have been listening to the podcast, you have heard their stories. If you haven't, I'm going to create a playlist that's special for my speakers so that you can kind of, you know, check them out and learn a little bit about them. But they are awesome. They all have a lot of experience about, you know, self-awareness and being self-aware and applying what they know to their careers and their lives. So I think that they are um, really good people for you to receive this information from. Uh, Tickets are on sale. You can check them out on Eventbrite. I'll put the link in the show notes and I will be promoting this all month. So there will be information on my Instagram page, on my website and all over. So please check it out. Check out the link. You can um, find out more information, learn more about the speakers on my website and um, definitely get a ticket because it's going to be a great event. I hope you enjoy this episode. This episode is with Marsha Flemings and she is a speaker at my um, self-awareness event. She will be kicking off the event on October 9th. Well, she'll, she's my closer on October 9th, but she will be in that first part of the event. So I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. And if you're not already subscribed to the Oh Hell No podcast, please subscribe. I'm on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you can listen to a podcast, I'm there. So without further ado, let's get into today's interview. Welcome to the Oh Hell No podcast, where I, Keisha Nicole, delivers a daily dose of passion, purpose, and struggle by interviewing people who are living their best life doing what they love. Here on this podcast, every Oh Hell No moment serves a purpose. Now let's get started with the show. Welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. So today I have Marsha Flemings. She is an entrepreneur, best-selling author, (laughs) and she is also a life coach. So I'm excited to have her. Um, Welcome, Marsha. Thank you for being here. 
Thank you so much for having me. All right. So, Marsha, I heard you speaking at, I think it was the uh, Caribbean Women Power Luncheon, right? Yeah. And I was just so moved by what you had to say. And I was like, I have to have her on my show. So I'm really excited to talk to you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, that was that was an amazing event. We did it virtually. And, you know, I just find it's really it really is a feel good moment um, and so important when we can really come together. We can not just motivate and inspire each other, but we can say, listen, this is what I've been through. This is how I got through it. And use any part of my story to help you. You know what I mean? So for me, that's that's what I appreciate most about um, events like that. Yeah, it was really nice. I'm glad that I actually went. I loved hearing all you ladies speak and it was a great event. It's awesome. Thank you. And here we are this evening. Yes, right? Connections, connections. (laughs) (laughs) So I want you to give me two words to describe yourself and I'm as, at these different ages. So 10 year old Marsha, two words to describe you. And Marsha, that's my sister's name. Well, you know, my parents are Caribbean. They're from Jamaica too. So, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. So her first name is Alicia, but they call her Marsha. Yeah, listen, like all of Jamaica is Marsha. <laughs> yeah, so that's so... There are a few know. names that if you if you were born in the 80s, chances are you have that name. Marsha is one of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, okay, two words to describe 10-year-old Marsha. Um, 10-year-old Marsha was oddly outspoken, mm. but shy. Oh. I don't know if that makes sense. That's... But she, she could... She could speak up for herself, but she was also really shy. Wow. Okay. I think that my niece is like that, so I get it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 18-year-old Marsha. Ooh. Searching and hopeful. 25-year-old Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, 25-year-old Marsha. I think still searching and honestly probably a little bit lost. That time was a little rough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how did you get into your first career and tell everyone what it was? Because I heard a little bit of her story. So, guys, I'm going to walk you through it because I want you to hear it for the first time. So tell us what your first career was and how that came about. So my first career was in hospitality. And um, you may be able to relate having a Caribbean background, but my parents didn't necessarily say this. But I watched them. And so what I understood growing up was go to school, Mm -hmm. get your education, get a good job, build a career. Um, Longevity with a company was definitely something that was celebrated. So I just thought, okay, got my education. Let me go find a job. And really what I was hoping for at the time happened. I got the call weeks after I started, but I started with Sandals Resort International in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And... They actually offered me the job on the spot, but I was so holding out. Believe it or not, I wanted to be a flight attendant. I love traveling. I had been traveling as a child, and I just wanted to continue to see the world. But they offered me the job on the spot, and I just decided, you know what, let me go for this since it's on the table. Mm -hmm. And I did what I saw my parents do. I built a career out of it for 19 years. Um, And so it's taken me all through the Caribbean, I've worked with some amazing people. I've been led by some amazing people. And I I did my best to continue that legacy in how I, I led my teams. Um, but yeah, I've been in hospitality. Well, I was in hospitality for 19 years. And I did that through to March of this year. Wow. Yeah. So what did you dislike the most about working in hospitality? If there was anything that you disliked, because I feel like there's always something in when, you know, you no, work. for sure. I, I can find things because the truth is I discovered that it's really not what I was cut out to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I was not in love with having to deal with people who come on vacation. They have a particular expectation and you know, as a resort, as a team that you're trying to do everything to please them. And they're just some people that Mm -hmm. they can't be satisfied, (laughs) right? You you literally would have to go to heaven to take it down, to give it to them, to even try to appease them. And so there were things about it that definitely were not 
they were not the things that fire me up every single day, you know? And so there was, and that kind of became a, one of the things that I had to say, okay, is this what I want to do with my life um, for the rest of my life? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'd say dealing with um, complaining people who are beyond reason yes. <laughs> was one of those things for me. I could just imagine. Yeah. So what did you do in that position that you find to be something that you continue to use today in your current line of work? Um, you know what? I feel like, in fact, that entire career, the, the thing that I enjoyed the most, the thing that gave me the most fulfillment, and the one thing that caused me to be there for as long as I was, is actually the thing that I do now. For 19 years, I was able to help groom young people. I was able to help them map out a career path, decide what they wanted to be and who they wanted to be and how they wanted to serve. And I was able to help guide them to that. So I spent so much of my time helping my team and people who were not necessarily on my immediate team. Sometimes it was my colleagues, managers who were on on my level or executives that I was working with, that I was helping to guide them to their next level. And it's amazing how all of those 19 years, the good and the bad of it, really just equipped me for what it is that I'm building now. And I, I really do believe that Um, Rochelle, who is another speaker who was on that um, event, she said something. She said, there's no season of your life that's wasted. There's absolutely no season that's supposed to be wasted, but it's for us to be able to identify when we need to be drawing on it to use it, you know? So definitely the ability to help people now to figure out what's next for them and how to get there is, is the thing that. I definitely draw on the most. Yeah. I always try to ask people that question because I feel like when you're in it, you don't realize how it'll serve you later. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. And for they sure. can always like identify it. So it's definitely there. How did you realize that you definitely wanted to change courses? Was there something significant that happened or was it like a gradual, you know, progression where you just got to a point where you couldn't take it anymore? Or did you just wake up one day and say, that's it, I'm done? There was a gradual feeling at first that there was just this lack of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And even though I was getting things done and I was helping people, you can imagine being in hospitality. And as I started to to grow in the business and get more and more promotions, I just spent so much of my day doing tasks that really did not leave me fulfilled. And the things that gave me fulfillment, I wanted to be able to do more of. And I was really unsettled about how I would be able to do more of that and honestly just played it safe. That's, that's just the truth of it. I just thought this is a good job. I've been with a good company. I've been able to grow with them. I've been able to help other people grow. And it just felt like, okay, you'll be silly to just walk away from this, not knowing exactly what you want to do. And then there was a major event and the major event was my son. Mm. (laughs) I have a three year old, um, he was, he's going to be four next month. He was born in 2016. And while I was pregnant with him, I was I started writing these letters to him. I just wanted to start, even at that time, to tell him about who he could be in the world, how he could serve, that he gets to choose the type of man that he becomes. And um, in 2017, it was, I was writing another letter to him. I was sitting up in bed. He was in his crib in his room, and I was writing another letter. And this particular letter I was telling him, you know, that there's really no limit to what he can accomplish as long as he decides it in his mind. I was just talking to him about not allowing fear to limit him. And as I wrote that letter, and I mean, many times when I talk about it, I could get emotional because I recognize that, okay, you're telling the child one thing, but if he's looking at your life for the example of it, is he truly going to see that? And in that moment, I thought about how Watching my parents, I did exactly what they had done was to find a job and build a career. My mom was an educator for so many years up until her retirement. And the school that she did her teacher's training at when she went to to college, that's the school that she did her entire um, career at. That's where she was her entire life. My dad pretty much worked with the same company until the parent company took him on. And I had done the same thing. And I was just like, you're not fulfilled. 
So how hypocritical is it to be telling your son and, and to intend to groom him and grow him to really pursue those things that mean a lot to him, to pursue those things that he believes to be purpose and to be true and right for him. But here you are playing it safe. And it was just the thought of him watching me mm-hmm. and learning something that I didn't want him to learn that kind of said, okay, you've got to get yourself in gear. Yeah. That you have to make the change. And, and what they say is true. Like your kids do change you. It definitely yeah. has that, um, that kind of gets your stuff together. Right. So what, do you remember what it was that made you want to write these letters in the first place? So I'm a natural writer. That's the first thing that I started doing as a child. It's the first thing that I said that I wanted to do at eight years old. I said that I wanted to publish a book mm-hmm. and I had set, I had set the goal to do it by the age of 21, I believe it was. And that in of itself speaks volumes because and kind of goes back to the shy thing that I was telling you about at 10 years old, because at eight I said it, but I was just even then so critical of the things that I would write. So I would write and my family would read it, friends would read it, and people thought it was great, but I'd pick it up an hour later or a day later and go like, ah, oh, this, this is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it really was something that was always a natural part of me. And just to kind of take that a step further it's made me really conscious to pay attention now, even with my son, what are the things that he's naturally inclined to do? What are the things that he naturally enjoys? Because I just think that my parents, they they did their absolute best. You know, they wanted the best for my brother and I, they did the best that they knew how they gave us all that they had. But I think that they didn't quite see that this was something that they could nurture and they just allowed me to do it if I wanted to and not do it if I didn't want to. And so it just, it just fell by the wayside. Mm. So when I became pregnant and I thought, okay, what if, and again, I kind of sometimes think worst case scenario, but I just went, if something should happen to me, how do I make sure that all the things that I've gone through, all the lessons that life has taught me that I'm able to make sure that he's he's able to benefit from those things. Right. I thought you're not entertaining enough to do home videos. So <laughs> let's write. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's how it happened. Wow. Okay. So when you decided that you wanted out, did you have an escape plan or did you kind of say, okay, I'm just going to take this day by day and see what happens? So my brother, um, my only sibling said to me, create an exit strategy. Mm -hmm. He definitely told me, he said, create an exit strategy. Um, Don't try to wing it. Don't just get up and move, um, you know, just without a plan. And that's not who I am in any event, Mm -hmm. but I kind of didn't know where to start. And I believe that when you are truly in a place where you want to walk purposefully, the people and the circumstances that are meant to allow that to happen, will they will fall into place. I really do believe that. And a, a colleague of mine at the time, she came to me and she said, you know, um, I did this life coaching certification. It's really something that I think that you would be good at. And I think it's something you should explore. I really didn't know much about coaching. And so I started to look into it and I, I took quite a few months to really decide. But the more I looked into it, the more I decided, okay, this is something that really would help me um, continue to help other people. Mm -hmm. And so I started my certificate with that and still didn't quite decide, okay, what's the plan? What's the exit? Um, And so I started to set certain milestones or certain markers. I decided when my son needed to start school, I needed to be located close to my family. I had been away from them for as many years as I'd been working in hospitality. And I just wanted to be closer to my parents, closer to my brother. And I wanted my son to grow up with his family. So I said, okay, I need to be settled in Florida because that's where they are. And so by the time school gets around, we need to be there. And um, I kind of just reverse engineered from there. What do I need to do um, 
to, to get to that place. And so you look at the finances, you look at everything. You, yeah. How do I establish the business? What do I do with this coaching thing? Um, what position do I need to be in financially to be able to make this move? And so I, over time, did create a plan and things evolved, you know. Um, I can't say that I set out to start a business, mm -hmm. but when I decided to publish the book, I said, okay, you're publishing, you're getting your coaching, you just need to, you need to really say what this is and move in this direction fully. And so that's what I did. Okay. When you did start the coaching program, what was your goal? Like, what did you want people to benefit from this program or get from the program? I'm guessing you're talking about the, the coaching program that I've created. Yes. So you yeah. left your job, you planned an exit plan, you got a strategy going, and then eventually you opened your own business, right? Mm -hmm. Legacy yeah. life coach, right? Ripples well, you are, right. You are a legacy life coach. Mm -hmm. And I want you to tell us what that means too. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So tell All us right. what does, what is a legacy life coach? And when you did start your coaching business, what was your goal? So here's the thing. Um, first of all, the, the title of my book is Letters of Love and Legacy, yes. A Mother's Tale of Her Journey to Her Son. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I recognize is that the very things that I was trying to help my son with and the very things that I intend to help him see as he grows are the very things that I was helping these young professionals do um, at their level and at their stage in life is decide who you want to be, how you want to serve in this world, um, create a plan for how you're going to get there. And, you know, depending on what that plan is and what it is they want to accomplish, we start talking about what are the skills that you need to cultivate or the people that you need to be aligned with. And it was really understanding that our lives are meant to serve other people. Mm -hmm. And when you serve other people well, you make an impact on them, you make an impression and when you're able to touch them and make that impression, whatever that helps to create in them, they then use that to help somebody else. And that impression continues with each person that is affected by it. So I just, it was really just the idea of helping all of us understand, or as many people that I could serve understand that our lives are more than just about us mm -hmm. um, and that true impact and true legacy comes from how we live and how we serve other people and just being just doing that from a very authentic place. And that just became something that it, it just couldn't get out of my mind. And I just decided this this is where I wanted to focus. And it it just felt right. It yeah. felt right. That's now, I do have to say that things unfold you know, and sometimes we get into this idea of, OK, I need to find my purpose and I need to just pursue that thing. And it's going to look this way and this is how it's going to go. And that's not what it that's not what it often is. Yeah. Things unfold. Life is a journey. I quickly created an online course after publishing my book and understanding that I could make it into a course. Mm -hmm. And it was designed, again, to help people live intentionally, decide who you want to be in this life and show up that way. And it really didn't do what I, I was hoping that it would do. And I, I was kind of out there winging it and just learning about the business. And it took a coach, because I was working with a coach, I've worked with a few, actually. And it took one of them talking to me. And after a while, she said to me, she's like, I don't know how you don't see it. She's like, where you are meant to be serving is in leadership. And she just started talking to me about all that she's picked out of my life that she's heard me talk about so passionately. And she said, I don't know how you don't see it. So I came back, sat with myself, prayed about it. And really started to pick my life apart. And I was just like, how oh, did I not see it? Mm -hmm. Over the years in leadership, while I was leading, this was the very thing that I always would seek to grow in. I, I did programs with Cornell. I did programs that were powered by Harvard to learn about leadership. And it wasn't ever when I was pursuing coaching. It was because I wanted to make sure that I was learning how to serve others well through leadership and was helping everybody else that I could who would listen to me, who would give me the opportunity to help them learn how to do that as well. And 
after stepping away from my my business, my uh, previous career, I just decided, you know what? Let me focus on young professional women who are stuck in their career um, because I, I, I made some of those mistakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I didn't only learn from my successes and my promotions and the people I helped. I made some poor decisions. I made some mistakes and things that um, made me stuck at one point. I saw other women stuck who were working their asses off but there were just things that they were doing that were not helping them to move forward. And I really just wanted to help those women understand that it's possible for you. You don't have to stay frustrated. You don't have to lay awake at night wondering, OK, is this ever going to happen for me? And let me use what I've learned through my own experience, through what I, the knowledge that I've gone out to, to, to get. Let me help you make that happen for yourself. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the book because I had book questions, but that was later. But because you brought it up, let's go to the book. So okay. you started writing letters to your unborn son. And mm -hmm. then when he was born, you were still writing these letters because you're just documenting all of these thoughts and things that experiences for him. And then it turns into a book. So how did that turn into a book? Like who said, <laughs> make this a book? Like tell us how that happened. And so, then how it turned into a course. <laughs> okay, so um, I am a Christian, mm -hmm. and at the time I wasn't I wasn't living a very Christian life, <laughs> not not true to what my faith really is, right? But that is my belief, and and that's my core. Mm -hmm. And um, it was March March two thousand and eighteen. That was a very major shift for me that year. 2018 was a, was a shifting year. Um, I had set very intentional goals for that year, and they were with very specific intent, very specific things that I was looking for because it was a part of my exit strategy. But I was using that year to clarify what it is I would be doing once I leave. And so I wanted to, you know, attend certain events. I wanted to do certain courses just so that I could clarify within myself what direction I was moving in. So March 2018, I'm on a flight from the Bahamas to Florida because my father was going to be turning 60. And I'm writing a letter on the plane because, oddly enough, the plane, being on a flight is someplace that I feel a lot of clarity. So I often write while I'm on flights and I'm writing this letter. And as audibly as I hear you, I heard this is the book you should publish. Wow. <laughs> I mean, as audibly as I hear you. And that's happened a few times in my life. So I, I was able to recognize when it was happening and I stopped writing and I sat back in the chair and I'm just like, God, you can't be serious <laughs> like, because there's some very personal experiences in the book. Yeah. And these were just meant to be shared with my son to help him. And I believed in being open and transparent. So I had no problem sharing those things with him and, you know, him coming to understanding what those situations were as he gets older. But putting it out for public consumption was obviously something very different. And... I was sitting there the rest of the flight, went through customs and immigration and still was just like, is this for real? But from situations in my life in the past, I've learned the cost of disobedience. Mm. And so I knew it was not, it was not optional. I, I had to be obedient to that voice and I just had to settle into the place of, I am just going to be obedient and Whatever purpose this is meant to serve, then I'm going to trust that this is the purpose it will serve. And how it actually became a book was um, after thinking, OK, I'm not just going to put all the letters together. I'm going to actually speak to specific themes, forgiveness, gratitude, love, our mindset around money, all of those things. I said, I want to speak to the reader first and then share the letter that I wrote on that particular topic um, and I, one of the things I did in 2018 was to attend several events. And the very last one was an event that was hosted by Lisa Nichols, um, Speak and Write to Make Millions. And I thought I was going for Lisa Nichols. And I did end up working with her one-on-one, um, -on -one, but I made connections with another lady there. And that was truly divine because 
I went by myself to that conference. I knew nobody there. I was in a room of hundreds of people and ended up connecting with this woman that helps people get published. And that's, wow. that's just how it happened. <laughs> that is so crazy. I live for stories like this. <laughs> oh my God. It, it's crazy. Like, but I, I just, I've seen it happen so many times that when you surrender to purpose, it's going to align. It may not align in your timing yeah. and you may be moving in one direction thinking that this is the reason for it, but it, it's, it all falls into place. It all falls into place. Yeah. So my question is, how do you know when that voice is the voice and not your voice? Okay. Oh. So I don't know how much time we have, but I've, I've had, I've had very specific experiences throughout my life that are not just talking to me to tell me about something that I should do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of examples really quickly because it's not always an audible voice. Sometimes there is literally like I've had situations where somebody would be walking by me and I'm going to sound crazy, (laughs) but there's almost like a flash of light over them. And I just, again, after having certain, um, after having it happen certain times, I just know that you need to go to them and I would go to them and usually, on my way to them, I'm in prayer Mm -hmm. just about what is it that I need to say? How do I need to serve them? How do I need to help them? And it's just produced some of the most mind blowing encounters. One of them I wrote about in the book and this particular encounter, this woman was in a completely different country. I was in the Bahamas. She was in a different Caribbean country. And I was actually at a time where I was thinking, okay, since I'm going to make this move, who is somebody that I could think of that um, is several steps ahead of me that I could learn from that could give me some advice? And I was in my home that morning thinking, and she came to mind, and I'm just like, not calling her. I'm looking at this woman catching flights on private jets. She's on stage talking to hundreds and thousands of people. And I just happen to have connection with her through work. I'm like, I'm, I'm not about to call her. Right. And in that moment, the voice of God said to me, that's not what you need to reach out to her about. Just as I'm saying it to you, this is how I'm hearing it. You need to go to her and ask her, what is it that I've told her to do that she hasn't done? Let her know it was three things. Let her know that it is possible there is still time and all that she needs, she already has, or it's making its way to her. And I was just like, "Mm -mm. no, sir, (laughs) not happening. Not her. Not. I said, the only thing I'll call her and ask her is, can you give me some notes? Right. How you've done what you've done. And in any event, um, I got ready and I was heading out of the house that morning. And just as I was about to turn that lock, his voice said, you know, if, if you leave, you know, you're not going to do it. And I had the worst attitude about this. I kid you not. I shut my door. I walked back into my house. I threw my bag down and I'm literally talking out loud to God. Like if you make me look stupid, this morning, <laughs> it was the most ridiculous thing. And, and again, I wasn't I was, and I'm still on my spiritual journey. Um, I have a deeper sense of commitment to to my my faith now than I had then. But I just had so many experiences prior to then. I just knew what was happening. And I was was having a full-blown attitude. Anyway, I picked up the phone. I tried to send her a voice note maybe like three or four times, canceled them, and eventually just sent one through my phone in my bag. And I'm like, I hope you're happy. And if I look stupid, it's going to be on you. And just complaining. And, um, I drove to work. It took me about 15 minutes to get to work. I had picked up a girlfriend of mine. And just as we came out of the car, my phone vibrated. I'm going to try to get through this without crying. My phone vibrated. And when I opened it, I saw she had sent me a message. So I clicked on it and it was a video message. She was bawling. I mean, she's not somebody that I had a personal relationship. We knew each other. We, we know each other by name, but she was on a much different level and serving on a much different level than I 
have ever been. I'm still not serving on the level that she she was or she she is. And she was bawling. And I played like three seconds of it and I cut it off. And my friend was like, what's wrong? And I'm just like, I'm like, what is God doing? Because who am I to be? I'm like, okay. And, and let me tell you how bad it was. I've kept that video. I've kept that video um, for the purpose of making sure that I never forget. Mm-hmm. Not just never forget that encounter, but never forget that God does speak and that he does speak to me. He speaks to all of us, right? But we have to kind of be willing to hear and to trust. Um, so I turn the video off. And then she starts calling my phone. And I'm just like, <laughs> I don't have anything else to say to you. This is literally all I heard. You know, and we had, I ultimately answered the call. And we had a conversation. And she told me exactly why those very three specific things came up. And she's like, she said, don't you ever say a voice. Because again, I just was not at a place in my spiritual journey where I was owning what my experience was. She said it it was not a voice. It was the voice of God. And he has used you to confirm to me what he's been instructing me to do. And she explained to me entirely what it was. And in fact, had a conversation with her mother the evening before. And I told her, I said, I'll never get rid of your video. She's like, I don't care. I, I trust you with that or I would never have sent it. But I hold on to it because whenever I have a doubt yeah. about anything, I just go, Marsha, you've had this experience. You're not crazy. <laughs> and it, it's one of many, but it's one, it's, it's one of the few that I have something so tangible that I can, I can keep, you know? Um, oh, my God. I forgot the question. I'm That's sorry. That's <laughs> so amazing. That's an amazing story. These are the stories that I live for because I too look for that kind of connection with God. Like I want God to talk to me, talk through me, use me, all of that stuff. Right. But I have to get myself, I got, I have to get that clarity, I guess, that I need to be able to hear, you know? So when people tell me stories like this, I just love it because I live for that. I I know what you mean, but I also always encourage people to understand that because he doesn't always talk to me the very same way, right? you know, and, and sometimes whether it's a past experience or it's somebody else that we're looking at, we tend to expect him to show up that particular way. And that's, that's limiting him, Mm -hmm. right? That's limiting him and how he shows up and how he can move. And so I think the most important thing is just, I've learned anyway so far, is to to be in a place of complete surrender and trust. And and it's constant work. It's constant work because, I mean, I was, I'm speaking a new thing into my life, queen of overthinking and just, I told you, I started writing, writing this whole book because I was like, what if I die? Right. <laughs> Something, you know, um, but it's, it's every day deciding, okay, God, you know what? Um, I, I trust what you said to me. I trust. And I, I've, I've built this as a part of my life where I say, when, when I can't hear your voice, when I'm not hearing that audible voice, when I'm not seeing a flash of light, when I can't seem to hear anything directly from you. I am going to trust that wherever my feet are going is where you are leading me. And I've just kind of, I've just had to leave it at that. Many times I've had to say, God, I'm just trusting that wherever my feet are going is where you're leading me. Yeah, I love that. I love how you also separated the books into those different areas, you know. So that was really amazing, too, how that came to you. We talked about the book, how it came about. What did you struggle with as a new entrepreneur and how did you overcome that struggle? Oh, what (laughs) didn't I struggle with? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So when I started this business and when I published the book, I was still with, I was still in my old career. I hadn't left immediately. Mm. Um, And so definitely one of the greatest struggles was being intentional about making time for my business, right? Um, I, my job demanded a lot, a lot of my time. 
And so I had to be very intentional about when I was making time for my business. And then that affected everything else. I had a young child, um, a fiance, you know, I had my relationship. So I, I was just like, it, learning what's priority mm-hmm. and how to allow things to have harmony versus balance and feeling like everything has to have the same weight and get the equal amount of time. It was learning, okay, what's most important in this moment? Um, What are the the things that are most important to me? And am I honoring those things with my time? Am I honoring those things with my intention? And that was something that I had to work through. Um, What was something else? I, I also had to work through being visible. You know, just like you spoke about it in the initial part of the interview with being on camera, just being visible, um, period, deciding to put so much of my life in a book, deciding to do what it takes to then allow people to know about the work that you've done. You have to talk about it. You have to go in a social space and um, talk about it. You have to create events or be a part of events and talk about these things. And everybody's not going to receive what you're saying. There's going to be somebody watching your podcast who's probably already clicked off thinking this woman has no idea what she's talking about. She doesn't hear from God. Who is she? Right, right, right. (laughs) You know, and you have to accept that everybody's not going to receive you, that you're not for everybody. And you have to learn to be okay with that. And so putting myself out there, because I told you, like, starting off at eight years old, I was shy. I was picking myself apart already. And that's something that's stayed with me. Um, and I've just probably learned how to, to manage it in different situations. But it was just... Those were some of the real struggles that I had to, to, to deal with in the initial stages. And, and some of it still do. Yeah, absolutely. And for all of you haters, I do hear from God. Excuse me. But That's I nice. was just saying, <laughs> I want to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, what has been the most rewarding part of your coaching program for you? Oh, it's funny because it is no different from the rewarding part that was in my previous industry. It's just that I get to do it. I get to make that the thing I do all the time. And um, when I first launched this particular program, so I have two programs, but this most recent one, which is the legacy of leadership, um, is helping young women do exactly what I set out to do to help them get unstuck in their career, to help them create a plan for their career. Do you know how many people, like they actually don't have a plan. People just go, you know, I'm going to start in this job and five, 10 years from now, this is where I'd like to be. I'd like to have this role or be in this position, but they don't actually have a plan. Even people who say, well, I'm naturally a planner, Mm -hmm. don't have a plan. They just have an idea of something that they want to go for. And so helping these women become clear about what do you want your career to be? Where is it that five to 10 years from now um, you want to be? And then let's figure out what is it going to take? What is it going to take? What do you need to learn? What is your company or industry looking for that you need to get as a part of your education um, certification, whatever the case may be? What's the kind of impact you need to be making in your organization for them to identify that you have the qualities to be assigned this role? What's the kind of impact you need to be making with your team? Um, How do you need to be serving your team so that they are performing at their best so that you they are producing um, the, the best results? And you are developing and building a reputation of producing high performing teams. And what I did when I first launched this program was to get a few women in because I I wanted to test it out. I wanted to operate in complete integrity. And I just decided, let me get a few women in for free. Let me work through this thing with them and let's see what results we get. And there's still so much that I'm learning because in that group of women, I had three of them who started their own business. They were still with their organizations. They still wanted to grow, but they started gaining so much clarity about who they are, what was meaningful to them, and that 
they could accomplish whatever they wanted to. So I didn't ignite any new, any new vision in them. These were things that were inside of them that they had suppressed or ignored mm -hmm. because they thought it wasn't possible for them. Right. And to see them do that, to see them actually follow my strategies. And in the middle of a pandemic, one actually getting a promotion in the middle of a pandemic, one actually getting a letter to say when things are basically back on stream that this is this is where we this is what we plan to have happen for your career. This is how we're going to invest in you, get you some training mm -hmm. and then all with the intention of appointing you to this role. And I was just like, OK, it's working. Yeah. It's working. And so that's what fuels me. I mean, even my discovery calls with just talking to the women who are trying to decide if they want to work with me, mm -hmm. um, getting off of those calls and hearing women say, listen, if I even never join your program, what I feel coming off of this call is something that I needed, that absolutely fuels me. It, it's, it, it, it keeps me going, honestly, and I'm so grateful for it. Yeah, that's amazing. And I love that you started out just to do a test with a bunch of people, you know what I mean? To see yeah. how it works. I have to be okay with what I'm selling you. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to just make a sale for making a sale, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm not trying to just get your money. I have to at night sleep with my conscience. I have to know that I've poured into you and I've given to you what I've committed. But I also want to know that I can actually help you. And I don't know why I questioned it because I was doing it for years before, but you're going to attract, I just was thinking you're going to attract people from different industries. People are doing different things. So make sure that you can serve them. But leadership is leadership. Vision is vision. Um, serving people is serving people. And once you're able to help people understand that that's, that's the core of leadership, that yes, your company has set these goals. Your company has set these objectives. And this is the team of people that you need to guide there. But in leadership, it's what you do with this group of people. It's how you make them feel about themselves. It's how you make them understand what's possible for them. It's how you equip them, how you groom them, and how you ultimately prepare them so that they're working to the point where you can step away. You, you are not needed and it's okay because you would have already mapped out a vision for what your career looks like and you are moving on to the next, but you're not moving on to the next without pulling somebody from your team and preparing them to step into your role. So it's for me to be able to serve with integrity, that's, that's of absolute importance for me. Yeah, I know your old place must miss you because having good leadership it's, it's like an anomaly, you know, because a lot of people are not equipped to lead. They're just there for the money and for the fame or whatever they get from that position. But they're not there to really pour into people. And like you said, bring someone here so I can move on. A lot of people hoard information because, oh, they're going to take my job. You know, those kinds of things. Yeah. But, you know, you know what a part of what causes that to continue to be what so many people experience is that there aren't there aren't a lot of people who are having this kind of conversation who are doing this kind of investment whether you are a manager on the job um, it's because many of them didn't have that example to understand that Right. This is actually what leadership is. It's not about being assigned a title. It's not about the salary that you get. It's not about the fact that you suddenly feel worthy and that, okay, I fit into this particular group of people now. It, it is actually just not about you, mm -hmm. except for what you know and learn and how you can help somebody um, know and learn those things too. Right. You know, But the example needs to be set and, and more people need to see the example for them to understand that that this is actually what leadership is. And, and I'm happy to say in the program, I've had women who come in who had that insecurity. They did have the insecurity and they did feel like, well, if I show somebody everything that I know and if mm -hmm. I fully train them and give them everything that I know, then what's going to make the company want to, to keep me? What's going to distinguish me from, from that person? And 
they were able to completely see why that was only harming them. Right. They were able to understand that one, you have that insecurity because you don't have a plan for yourself. You don't, you don't see that you don't see anything else that you're aiming to. And so you're, you're really just sitting there and at some point the company is going to let you go anyway. At some point it's going to end. And wouldn't you rather it end because you created a vision for what your next level looks like and you work towards that, you know, and, and, prepare somebody else to take over where where you are yes that is girl you're dropping gems (laughs) i love when my guests come and drop gems (laughs) (laughs) all right so what does legacy mean to you because you know this is like the buzz phrase right now build a legacy build um, on generational wealth and all this i'm like jesus (laughs) so it's so funny because I just, I I was wondering to myself if because I published the book with that word and it became such a theme for me, if suddenly, what what do they call it? Your reticular activating um, system. Mm-hmm. It's this part of your brain where, you know, if you decide, okay, I want this particular kind of car. Yes, you keep seeing color, it. <laughs> and then you keep seeing it, right. So I was thinking to myself, is it because this is a theme for me now that I'm seeing these things or was this like legit a buzzword before oh, girl, you know, I, know. I, I started out with it but for me it's just I, I have the line my life is my legacy mm-hmm. and what it means to me is that how I live the people I'm able to impact and what that impact does in them and the result of that and then they continue to kind of pay it forward whether consciously or not but the fact that you've made an impression on somebody, you've shown them a better way of doing something. It's created a change in them, in their perspective, in how they operate. And it allows them to operate from that space continually with others. And they are then setting that example for other people. You know, um, uh, last year, September, I had the opportunity to be on stage in front of a crowd of like 5,000 people in Atlanta at the, um, it was a jerk festival. Mm-hmm. And I shared with them, I said, if you think of any, any great person in history that accomplished anything meaningful, um, anybody that you pick and that you identify with, think about it. It's their life. It's, it wasn't, it wasn't their words. It wasn't their wealth, it was their life. It was the impact that they as a person had on other people and the change and the shift that that created. And so for me, I'm not even having a conversation about money. Not that there shouldn't be, right? Because in my book, I talk about our mindsets around money. And that's something that I'm still learning and shifting to this day. Yeah. But I'm just talking about who you are how you make people feel and and beyond how you make them feel, it's what you make them think and believe about themselves and then what that change creates. And so I heard, I think it was Oprah who said, Maya Angelou said it to her, that she'll never know what her legacy is and none of us can ever know because if I've impacted you in a particular way that's created this shift and you get into any space, And it has changed how you treat people, how you interact with people, how you invest in people. And then those people who are in your space, how you treat them makes them feel a particular way. They start to look at themselves. They start to make that change. And then that change in them is creating a change in somebody else. You'll never get to know. Right. If you had not reached out to me and, okay, you haven't seen my life. You were a part of an event and you heard about some parts of my life, but... Mm -hmm. If you hadn't reached out to me, I would never have known what part of my story impacted you or touched you or resonated with you. Yeah. And we are today having a conversation. We don't know who's listening to this call. We don't know what space they're in in their life and in their thought process and what they needed to hear and how this is going to possibly shift something for them. We don't know as leaders when we're on the job, people who come to work and what it is they're dealing with and they encounter you as a leader with compassion. They encounter you as a leader who sees them as a human being, treats them as a human being and not employee 2,459, you know, that's truly our legacy. Yeah. 
Yep, I did hear that quote too from Oprah, and and I was like, okay. wow, that's really a great way to look at it, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I agree. I love it. I love that explanation of legacy. <laughs> Thank you. So, what advice would you give to someone who's coming up and they grew up like us, where their family is kind of, you know, just go to school, learn your lesson and get a good job and stay with the company. I mean, I know times are shifting now where no one's committed to any company. These young people, it's like from one extreme to the next. You know, when we're growing up, we're told to like stay with the company, you know, get your benefits, get your pension, all this foolishness. Right. But the kids nowadays, they're like, oh, I just graduated college. They're not paying me. I'm quitting. And it's like, dude, yep. you have to get yep. experience. <laughs> so it's a, it's a whole different era. Yeah. So what would you tell someone who is young, coming up, just stepping into adulting, who is trying to figure out what their passions are and things are? What advice would you give them about soaking up things in the workplace? Um, okay. So first of all is one you being able to grow, you being able to move forward, you being able to align with purpose, you being able to get to the next level, meaningfully in particular, is going to require you to be open and be self-aware, right? Um, you have to want to learn. So it's it's not enough to say, okay, I want to, I want to earn this amount of money, or I want to get that particular position, but Along with that is there should be the desire to say, okay, let me learn. Let me understand what it takes to do that and to fulfill that role and to earn that thing and be willing to do it. So it's not just about the outcome. When you're looking at the outcome, um, what's the expression? Basically, if if that's the result you want, you're looking at somebody and you want what they've accomplished or you, you aspire to it. They're, they'd had to do work to get there. Mm-hmm. And so be open to doing the work. And the work is not just the technical work or the physical work. It's also the work on yourself because every next level is going to require another level of you. I could not, 10-year-old, 25-year-old Marsha could not be functioning the way that I, like yesterday's Marsha could not be functioning <laughs> today. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, so you have to, you, you really have to understand that being open to doing the work inside of yourself is also just as important. You know, um, there was a conversation I was having with a girlfriend recently that it's just the whole idea that you see all of these people who have, who celebrities who have all this wealth and it still falls apart because you are still the person with the wealth, you are still the person with the fame. And so whatever dysfunction lies in you, whatever weakness lies in you, you are, you are at the center of it all. And if you are not whole, if you're not getting better, if you are not growing, it's still all going to fall apart. So, so identify that there is work to do to get there and be willing to do the work, the external work and the work on yourself. Cause I think the internal work is always more important. Absolutely. I'm so glad you said that. So what about someone who has been adulting for years and now, you know, COVID has uh, caused people's lives to change, right? So let's say you've been working in an industry for X amount of years and all of a sudden you find yourself unemployed. What advice would you give to them about reinventing themselves or trying to figure out what to do? This is a tough question for me because I don't think there's any one answer that fits everybody. But I do think that there are things that all of us would be best served to be aware of. Again, going back to my faith, you know, when the Bible tells you don't be afraid or when God says don't be afraid, he's saying don't be afraid because he knows that it's in our nature. It's it, our flesh, as human beings, we're going to feel fear. Like if I hold you off a cliff, you're, <laughs> that's going right. to come. You don't have to work that up. That's a natural reaction. But the point is to not let it stifle you or hold you back. And I get that that's a tough thing to say 
when all of this craziness is happening around us, like it's tough to tell somebody to don't let fear cripple you. Mm -hmm. Don't let it make you stay stuck. But the truth of it, if you think about it, you've lost the job and you're sitting and thinking, okay, I have this skill or maybe this is something that I could venture into, but I don't know how it's going to work. So you sit where you are and you don't make an attempt at that thing and you just keep telling yourself, but I don't know how it's going to work. And meanwhile, you're just sitting there and nothing is changing Mm -hmm. when there is no result that you're producing because you're not moving. So you either could be producing the result, gaining something, getting some money, whatever, building a business, or if it's even not producing the result you want, at least you are learning that, okay, this is what I need to change or this is how I need to approach it. So I think that one of the biggest things is just pushing beyond the fear that we feel. We are confronted with this situation. Yep. If you've lost a job, that's that's a real thing. Now what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What What can you make happen? What opportunity is there available to you? And also recognize that If you take on an opportunity right now that's not where you want to be, that's not what you had in mind, that's okay. That's okay just as long as you understand how it's a part of your plan. So you still have a plan for three years, five years from now. You still have something you're working towards. It's just that I have to insert whatever this new role is, whatever this new initiative is, whatever this new business is, I need to insert that as a part of the way of sustaining me to keep me on track. Um, When I worked with Lisa Nichols, she always said, keep your goal in mold and your plan in sand. Nobody planned for COVID. Mm -mm. Nobody planned for all of this. It's happening. And so whatever plans we had, we now have to be able to shift and adjust, but we, we can still keep our vision and just understand I need to make adjustments. If you're using GPS and there's a roadblock, there's an accident, you're given alternative routes and it may take you two hours longer. It may take you two years longer to get there, but we can't just throw our hands up. You know what I mean? And we all have, we all have a talent, a skill, a gift that is something that we can use, but we're overlooking it. I never thought anything of my writing. I never thought, and it's something that I always discarded. Um, And after publishing the book and having certain conversations, I realized it was always present, but I I didn't value it the way that I should have because it came naturally to me. Mm. But when I looked back at it, there were so many people who would come and say, okay, can you read this email before I send it off? Um, I've done this project. Can you read it and tell me what... It was there was always something present about my writing, but I was undervaluing it. And oftentimes we undervalue our gift because it comes naturally to us. We think, oh, it's nothing. Everybody can write well. Everybody can bake. Everybody can sing. Everybody can make jewelry. We 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 don't value it because it comes so naturally to us. So there's also an opportunity. So look for kind of just sit with yourself, sit with yourself and see, okay. What's something inside of me that I haven't tapped into? How, how can I use this thing? You know, I think that's also important if, if you're not seeing opportunities immediately in front of you. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. So um, let's see. There are a lot of people out there with advice on living intentionally, right? So, you know, as you know, living purpose driven lives and all that stuff, that's another buzz thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> it seems like it's everywhere. So, what is unique and authentic about your viewpoint on living intentional and making an impact? What's unique about it? I don't know if I I can establish that it's unique cuz I don't know if anybody else is I've been kind of so focused on working on myself Mm -hmm. and helping the people that are around me who want to work on themselves. But I just know what's meaningful about it. Um, And it's, it's deciding that, okay, what do I really want my life to look like? Who do I want to be? So it's not just 
what home do I want to live in? What car do I want to drive? What, who do I want to be? You know, do I want to be the person who struggles to always get over something, get over the hurt, get over the pain, get over the betrayal, whatever the case is? Um, who do I want to be in this life? And am I willing to do the work to get there? Um, and I think that that's very often the first component that's missing for so many people is we want it. You know, we actually want to be happy. We want to have joy in our lives. We want to be healthy. We want to be fit. We want to have a more productive um, personal relationship or a better relationship with our children. We want these things, but when it comes to actually doing the work to get those things, that's where a lot of people struggle because we, we just maybe think it's going to come out of thin air. Yeah. And so you want to build more meaningful relationships. It's going to likely require you not to just stay stuck home. Well, maybe that's not the best example with COVID, right? <laughs> now, but not just, okay, not just be home watching the television or just staying in your bubble. If it's really important to make, to build meaningful relationships, you are going to have to extend yourself. You are going to have to reach out to people and maintain those connections. If it is really important to become healthier, um, it is going to take you committing to the workout program or the, the healthy eating, whatever the case may be. It's committing to the work. It's creating the vision, creating the vision and committing to the work. And it, it it's really now just aligning with a strategy that I've put into my course called the PEG strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's plan, execute, grow, plan, execute, grow. I believe that plan, create a very clear vision of what you want, of what you want your life to look like, of who you want to be, what you want to accomplish, whatever it is you're thinking about, what's the vision, be clear on that, right? And then what's the work that needs to be done to get there and actually do it. And, and it's, I don't know, I, I don't know how to make it sound any sexier or, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just that we have to commit to the work. No, I think it's, I think your viewpoint is unique, the way that you go about your program, the way that you do things and the way that you are really, truly passionate about it. I mean, the fact that you started this and did like just a test, right? Let me just try to help these people and see if this works. That says a lot about who you are as a person, you know? And that was eight weeks. Yeah. That was, that was, that was eight weeks of being on phone calls with them. And separate and apart from that, there was time of creating the videos for the course, creating the worksheets. It wasn't just hopping on coaching calls. Like I was really building out content for them, you know, and I said, let me, do, if, if, if I do this thing and I don't produce any results, this is not it. <laughs> right. <Something else. laughs> right. Most people take your money while they're doing that. <laughs> right? I, I, but you, I didn't know how to be okay with that. Right. So that no. says a lot about who you are and what you were developing and how you want it to really impact people's lives. So I definitely uh, feel. Yeah. Like, I'm sure there are other business women who probably have done it. And they're like, girl, you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I would have charged and that's okay because you are okay with that. So mm -hmm. you live in a way that's true to you. That was not true for me. And I did what was true for me. Yeah. So of course, do you feel like you're living a purpose-driven life and doing purpose-driven work? And if yes, what part of your work and I already know what you rejoice in because <laughs> we talked about that <laughs> yeah. so I think you probably would say yes right yeah um I definitely feel that I'm on the path to purpose mm -hmm. it's hard for me to ever say okay this is it because I do think that as long as we are living mm -hmm. that there that means that there's something else that we need to be doing there's something else that we need to be producing whatever space that is that is that we occupy. Yeah. So I think I'm on the path to it, but I've learned that it unfolds. And so in one season of my life, the the ultimately whatever it is in this particular season, it doesn't look the same way. On the way to that thing in this season, it may just look this particular way. So I think I'm definitely on the path. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Uh, it, it is purposeful work to me. And like you said, I've said it a couple of times. Yeah. Being able to see somebody shift their lives, shift their mindset, shift their money. Um, 
and, and say, Marsha, thank you, because this is how you helped. That's, that's powerful to me. That's yeah. absolutely powerful to me. Yeah, changing somebody's life. I mean, that's amazing. I love it. Yeah, I, I don't know if I should say changing their life. Of course you did. Come on, Marsha. Don't don't credit. don't be so modest. <laughs> no, but it, it's helping them because ultimately, ultimately they have to do the work. Right, oh, but and, what, and when they come into my course, I said to the ladies, I, "That's the first thing we do in week one." I said, "Become clear," because especially coming into this for the women that came in um, with my beta group. It's easy to not take this seriously because you're not investing any money. Right. People pay money to pay attention. You're not paying any money. So the work that we do in week one, whether you came in the beta program or you've paid me, is that you need to be clear. What is it that you want to gain out of this experience? What's your intention for this? What's your intention for your life? And why is it that you're committing your time and your money to this now? So I could provide you with all the tools if you decide not to use them then it's it's still not it's still on you yeah. you know it's still on you i feel like it's a combination like you said you as the individual have to do the work and you have to be ready to make that commitment to do the work but you're giving people the tools to do that work because a lot of times we cannot get out get out of our own way own way yeah. right so yeah, we need those tools and we need that help it's so funny because I have a business as well. Um, Besides me doing my podcast and all this stuff, I listen to like a lot of people sell stuff or try to sell stuff. And it always makes me feel like, hmm, I see these people say, oh, um, join my program and um, I'm going to show you how to make seven figures and and go from this to that. And you're going to be, you know, making all this money and whoa. And I'm like, Okay, and they're like showing themselves on jets and and these luxury cars and doing this and that, right? And I'm like, well, if they have so much money and they know that you don't have money and you're trying to get money, why do they charge so much money for these programs, right? Because they'll say, come to my program, right? It's this, it's (laughs) $20,000, even though they know that you don't have that money because you're trying to build your business or get wherever you need to go. And then what happened to me is I I contacted someone to try to help me and it was ridiculously expensive. And I was like, okay, I cannot afford that. I'm not doing that. And then I said, I'm going to have to teach myself how to do this now, right? Mm -hmm. So then it became clear to me why people charge all this money to give you this information. So... To, I say all that to say that the it, what you have here and here and your experiences and all of that stuff, it's very valuable. And if you're not sharing it with people, even though they have to pay for it, they wouldn't be able to get to that next level. They just oh, wouldn't. Yeah. Because yeah. we yeah. need help. Or it would take them longer. It, or it would take them longer or maybe not at all because some people, they're they're not... Um, self-sufficient or they won't get up and go get the information. Yeah. Yeah. Just like you said, you know what, let me go try to teach myself. Some people will just think, okay, well, it's not possible because I can't afford it. Exactly. They would just give up and say, oh, this is not meant for me. That's a sign from God. I'm not going to do it. Right. Listen, and let me tell you something. We, (laughs) we investing in yourself is something you have to decide that you are willing to do if you really want to progress, if you want to move forward. And when I say invest, it's not always just about your money, right? right? Um, and it, it comes back down to the same thing. It's like doing the work, deciding that I'm going to make the sacrifice of reading the book or doing the research or whatever the case may be. Like I, I, I absolutely have to make that step, make that investment, make that sacrifice. It's important. Yeah. But you are right that, and all of us, all of us. It's not just, it's not just me. And I had to, I had to work. I had to work to become okay with understanding that, you know, these people who are out there charging all of this crazy money. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like, I'm not that salesperson. So I truly had to understand that. Okay. Number one, you're in business, but in, in still operating, um, in integrity for myself, I know that I need to have a conversation Mm -hmm. and I need to show you how I can serve you. And then I need to give you the grace to choose whether or not 
you think I can serve you or you want to work with me. So I, I really can't even talk about sales because that's not my language. <laughs> okay. I need to learn it better. Obviously, I'm in business, so I can't just be like, well, that's not who Marsha is. I, that's a skill I need to learn. Yeah. That's something I have to continue to invest in in, in learning. But um, all of us, there's something that our experiences have taught us. There's value that we have that we can offer to other people. Mm -hmm. And it's just for us to be able to recognize that. I don't care who you are. Yeah. Um, it's, it's crazy to me that I had the three women who were in my course who started their business. And funny enough, I've been attracting women who are stuck in their careers, but they actually want to go into entrepreneurship. And they're looking at me like they're getting on discovery calls with me, asking me um, if I could work with them or if that's something that I do. And at first I was just like, nope, I'm, I'm still working this thing out. And a friend of mine said, yeah, you are working things out, but do you realize that for somebody who has not started, who has not taken the first step, who does not know what the first step is to take, that you may be five or 10 or 15 or whatever, however many steps ahead of them, and that you can take them, what you have know is valuable to them because they don't have it. Mm -hmm. And when they get to that level, then maybe there's somebody else that teaches them the next 10 steps. Right. You know, So we have to recognize that all of us have some value that we can give to somebody else. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I learned. And I think that was a lesson from God because I was, I was telling my friend, this is so ridiculous. Why are these people charging so much money for this? If they're making all this money and they know I don't have money, why are they charging me money? Right. Yeah. So, but it's because it took them a lot of time, a lot of, ups and downs to gain that experience and that knowledge. The same thing that I am actually going through and learning things in my business. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to turn around and give it to you for $10. No. <laughs> yeah. We've, we've got to learn to value yeah. what our experience and, and knowledge can offer to somebody else. And I'm, I'm still learning that. Yeah. So that, yeah. that was something that I have, I feel like I need to share, but yeah. So, this is the Oh Hell No podcast. I always ask my guests to share <laughs> their Oh Hell No moment. So you know what an Oh Hell No moment is. We have them daily, right? Yep. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. But I want you to share a moment that has taught you something or changed your perspective on something. Yeah. So like you said, they happen daily for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and when I thought about it for this for this conversation, there's just one that kept coming to mind. Um, and I was, I was trying to dismiss it, but it kept coming. So I'll just share that for whatever reason. I guess somebody needs to hear it. Um, in my previous career, I had a boss who I don't mean to dishonor him at all because there are so many good qualities and there are things that I absolutely learned by observing him. But none of us are perfect, you know, and, and something transpired. And I definitely had a hell no, hell no moment. Um, there was something that was on the table, a promotion that was on the table. And based on conversations that happened before, I, I made a mistake too, um, because I just went on the fact that, okay, this was the conversation and this is where things would be going. And so I didn't, I didn't apply. I didn't go and have the another conversation when it did eventually become available and the position went to somebody else. And ultimately the, I, I, I blamed, I didn't blame anybody. I owned the fact that, okay, you really didn't apply. You didn't follow up. You just sat there and thought this was going to come to you. Mm. <laughs> but the oh hell no came when a conversation happened a few months down the line. And he said, you know what? I hate to, say it this way because I was saying, okay, let's have a transparent conversation because you and I know what we talked about. Why, why is it that this didn't happen? Let me know. So I know if there's something that I need to grow from other than the fact that if I want it, I need to go for it. And he said, I hate to say it this way because I know how it's going to make me look, but I have to be honest. He said, when I recognized that you were starting your family and you were pregnant, I just made an assumption that it was going to change how you work and, and what you give. And it was wrong of me. 
And while I appreciated that, my oh hell no was okay. I am never ever going to leave my life, my possibility, my opportunities, my next level completely in the hands of somebody else. I, I, I choose never to give somebody else that much power over my life. Mm -hmm. And the oh hell no was like, nope, not doing this, not doing this no more. If I can give so much of myself, my time, my energy, my life, um, all that I have, and in one moment, somebody can say because somebody can think that because, okay, she's going to have a kid. Chances are that's going to change. Chances are how she works is going to change. Then let's not do this. And I was just like, nope, I, I can't continue to, to, to do this. And that was also one of the things that made me say, yeah, that exit strategy that you need to create get on it. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> get, on it, get on it. So that was a moment for me that I said, nope, I'm not choosing to leave that much power in the hands of somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah. You got, you got to watch your own back. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I get, men are so interesting. <laughs> I can't. Uh, I know. That's a good, interesting. <laughs> yeah, they are. So tell everyone where they can connect with you because I'm sure they will want to after hearing all of this. Yeah. So I'm on a few social media platforms. I'm on Instagram and Facebook and it's just my name, Marsha Flemings. That's M-A-R-S-H-A-F-L-E-M-M-I-N-G-S. -E um, pretty straightforward. You'll see my nice shortcut <laughs> with right here posted up there. And I also have a free group on Facebook where I invite women and I just give them free tips, free strategies about life and legacy and, and leadership um, and just kind of give them little tidbits that help them along the way for people who may not be able to invest in the course, but still to give them some kind of information to help them in the, the different areas of their life. I'm also now um, looking at LinkedIn as a platform and building, building my connections there. So I'm on LinkedIn. And my website, um, MarshaFlemings.com. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so glad that you came and that I was able to meet you. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. This was yes. so good meeting you and connecting with you. Okay. I love what you are doing. I listen Thank to a you. few of your, um, to your, to your podcast and I'll be listening to some more. Thank you for connecting you. Yeah. and for serving the way that you do. Thank you, know? you. Yes. Yes. I am. I'm hoping that people are receiving this information because I think it's valuable. I think it's empowering and I love doing this. So yeah, this has been my little um, passion project. <laughs> yeah. You are serving, you are serving yeah. and not only are you serving, but you are, you are being a connector because others who can serve, you are giving them an odd, you are giving them a platform to, to, to yes. serve others. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that is the, um, that is the hope here. Listening's better when your station gets to know you. And financial advice is better when your banker gets to know you. That's what City National Bank believes. The better they know you, the better they can meet your financial needs. Discover your way up at cnb.com. I earned a bachelor's in hospitality management. I managed a restaurant for a while and enjoyed helping others, but I wanted a different way to serve. Then I discovered the Felician Way and enrolled in Felician University's Accelerated Nursing Program. Felician ABSN is offered in two accelerated formats, a hybrid program in Parsippany and an on-ground program in Rutherford. Plus, Felician University provides a values-based education, which is important to me. Discover the Felician Way. Search Felician ABSN.